What's up and welcome to the Beyond Sundays podcast. My name is Brett Stewart and I am the host. And today my co-host is Adina Brown back with me. And we are excited about the episode today. Our guest came in all the way from Tyler, Texas. She is a licensed professional counselor, a marriage and family therapist, an author, a speaker, and a mom to two children. So we're excited about all that she has to share. Let's dive into today's episode. Well, all right. Today we have Chrissy Lane Garland with us. Chrissy, hello. Hi. Man, it's good to be with you. Chrissy drove in from Tyler, Texas. Wow. And believe it or not, when she drove in, uh, she actually brought a really big rainstorm with her oh. uh, from East Texas. So for those in the Abilene area, um, by the time you listen to this, it was rain that we got a couple weeks ago. Uh, but yeah, you can thank Chrissy because she brought that in with her. Oh, you're welcome. On the way. <laughs> but man, Chrissy, it's great to have you with us. Uh, tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do, uh, but also tell us about the connections to Abilene and to Beltway because you're not just yes. some Tyler girl. Uh, mm-hmm. You actually got a lot of connections to us here. So yes, I'm actually a West Texas girl. So oh, yeah, born and raised close to this area. And um, like Brett said, my name is Chrissy. I um, I am from Tyler, Texas. I am a mom. I have two beautiful uh, kids. They're twins. They're four years old, a boy and a girl, and just love, love, love being their mom. It's awesome. Um, I am also a licensed professional counselor. How long have you done that? I've been doing that for over 10 years in different capacities. So, and we'll talk more about that. But my connection to Abilene is I am a Hardin Simmons alumni. She's a cowgirl, (laughs) I am. I am. And actually, my entire family went to Hardin Simmons. Oh, wow. Wow. My family went to Hardin Simmons. And then I was was the one who didn't. I went to ACU, to the rival school. Dun, dun, dun. (laughs) No, ACU is awesome. I have a lot of friends that went there. and. Abilene's just a great place. And so I lived here for a little over four years and loved my time here. Um, I served at Beltway Park yeah. for two of those years and that I lived here. some of the here. OG days. Yes, yes. <laughs> I feel kind of old coming back because Abilene got really cool. <laughs> <laughs> Abilene and, and just all the things y'all are doing here. That's um, awesome. But yes, I served here. And so many, many years later, I'm back here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I'm so honored to be back here and excited to be back here and, yeah. and see some familiar faces, too. That's great. And just a, a minute ago, you were telling us, um, in part of your being here at Beltway, you served on the worship team, but then mm-hmm. you told us of a particular journey that you went through that kind of led you into the art of listening and which kind of led to your calling. Like, I want to hear more about that and, and let the <laughs> listeners hear about that. Yeah, so... Um, when I went to Hardin Simmons, I was a vocal performance major. I had big plans to be the next Sandy Patty. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we were just talking about her yesterday. <laughs> no, but I, I did. I, w- I wanted to be a singer. Um, I grew up in ministry. My dad is still a pastor, and I loved uh, growing up singing in church, singing in competitions. And so I went to Hardin Simmons for that and just followed in my family's footsteps. I had a really great program. And um just thought I had a plan for my life and that was going to be it. Um, but my senior year, my last year of college, I um, found out that I had a cancer scare and uh, a tumor had grown inside my throat. And to to remove it, they had to cut into my vocal cord. And so the doctor actually told me, Chrissy, you'll never sing again. Um, and And I think you'll be able to speak, but it'll be a soft whisper. And so within a day, I didn't even have a choice. Like, yeah. No other way I could heal from this. Um, so it was like my whole life was taken away from me in a day. And, yeah. um, and f- so for, for three months, I didn't speak. Wow. Not was, at all. Not at all. And I, <laughs> wow. I had a notepad. I mean, everyone wanted to be my friend, you know. I had a notepad. <laughs> I was like, that's how I talk to people. Um, but what I learned in those in those months of silence was the lost art of listening Mm. Um, because I couldn't talk because I couldn't perform and sing. I got to listen to people's hearts and their stories and observe. And um, it was actually a gift because um, I just got to know people in a different way. And, and even though God did give me my voice back, um, he called me into counseling and to be a therapist and, and said, this is your calling in your life. Wow. Um, and you will use your voice for something different than you originally expected. Wow. 
Um, so That's what good. could what was the hardest time at of my life uh, back then actually became the calling of my life now. Yeah. That's and I mean, even as we get into today's, you know, conversation, that, that theme kind of plays itself over, uh, mm-hmm. you know, I, I know for, for all of us, um, the things that end up being the most unplanned and even the most devastating that rock our world is often where, uh, not often, it is where we find the presence of God the mm-hmm. most and we have the opportunity if we seek him to to experience his healing, his wholeness, his restoration. And, and you know, we were just talking about it earlier, but what God does for us, what God does in us is also what he wants to do through us. Mm-hmm. And so um, y'all are going to, those that are listening, y'all are going to hear that theme kind of play out yes. as we dive a little deeper into Chrissy's story. Um, so I guess I'll just kick it to you and, and you know, go with it where you will. Sure. And, and Adina and I will ask questions and kind of let the Holy Spirit lead this conversation. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, and, and I'm, I'm going to share our story. And um, my hope is as I share, as I, I speak these words and, and share my experiences that you can find hope and mm. that those who may can relate um, to what I'm sharing um, will reach out for help. Uh, we'll talk to talk about it. We'll, we'll, um, not be ashamed of it. Yeah. And as some of the listeners may know, y'all are doing a series here at Beltway Park about yep. mental health. Yep. It's called Flip the Script. Uh, and in the closing of the show, I'll let you know if you haven't been able to watch those sermons and go along with it, um, I will let y'all know how to do that. Mm-hmm. Yes. And so um, with my story, um, that's why it's so exciting that Beltway Park is addressing this topic because it is everywhere, and it is important that the church be talking about it mm-hmm. and the church be loving and helping those who struggle with mental illness. And um, even though I just shared a story of suffering in my life, that wasn't the end of my story by any means. Um, and I thought that was the hardest thing I would have to endure in my life. And um, it turns out that I've had to endure a lot more, um, but I am who I am today because of that. So um, just to share a little bit, about our story. Like I said, I was a pastor's kid. Uh, my dad is still in the ministry. My entire family is in the ministry. And um, when I went to graduate school, I got my master's in marriage and family counseling. That's where I met my amazing husband. Um, he was just so full of life. And um, yeah, I met him and we fell in love and um, really had plans. Again, that plan, this yeah. must be God's plan for our life, mm-hmm. to go into ministry and just conquer the world together and love people and help people. And um, shortly we found out that that's, that's not real life, right? Like this perfect plan that you have for your life isn't our day in and day out experiences. And so um, I slowly started seeing my husband struggle with depression, anxiety, um, burnout, from ministry and just from the Christian expectation that he had to be perfect since he was a pastor in ministry. Yeah. And, but he didn't know who to talk to about it. Um, It's not like everyone was sitting around talking about these things and he feared if he did talk about it, it would affect his job because Mm -hmm. he was struggling so deeply with this, these things. And so we just lived our life. We kept putting on our face and lived our life. And this was something we dealt with behind the scenes. Um, but really didn't talk about it. And by not talking about it, by hiding in shame, he started becoming physically ill. Mm -hmm. I believe that if we hold things in long enough Mm -hmm. and we run from them, that they will eventually come out in some form or fashion. And and so from all these experiences, um, he started getting physically sick. He, He started getting shingles and eventually he got cancer. And, um, in this time period that he started getting sick, he was uh, prescribed opioids. And opioids seemed to be a source of comfort for him, a way he could overcome these inner feelings of feeling unworthy and like he didn't matter and he wasn't good enough. Um, And then an addiction slowly started. Mm -hmm. So shortly after we found out he had cancer, um, It also came out he had this horrible addiction to opioids. 
And as pa- as a pastor who struggled with these things, it had to come out. Mm-hmm. And so the church praised him and, and stood beside him during the cancer. But then a week later, when the opioid addiction came out, we were we were immediately let go. Mm-hmm. Um, and just our life devastated mm-hmm. and and taken away and not understanding. Even though as a counselor, I understand it in other people, but not understanding how it yeah. affected our own home, addiction and depression and mental illness. Um, it was it was just horrible. And the place we always turned to was the church, and we didn't have that. And yeah. so um, we really had to pick ourselves up and our belief system and try to understand God and suffering and the church's role in, in our healing process. And um, and he, he went to rehab. He got clean, and he was doing a lot better. Um, he was diagnosed with depression, mm-hmm. uh, chronic depression, which you can have situational depression, which is based on environment, situations around you, or you can have chronic, which can run in the family. It, it can be for a lifetime. Um, but with that diagnosis came a little hope because he was able to start medication. Um, and we got back into ministry mm-hmm. because that's, awesome. that's, that's what we're called to. Um, but the, the caveat <laughs> was, um, yes, we love you serving here. We think you're a great pastor, but don't tell anybody that you struggled with addiction. Don't mm-hmm. tell anybody that you have this diagnosis mm-hmm. and all those things you can deal with on your own. Um, spend time with the Lord, pray about it but we don't want it in the church. And if you knew my husband, he was very loud and didn't, <laughs> he, did, he wasn't good at being quiet. Um, but he started using it for ministry um, purposes and found that a lot of people in the church struggle yeah. with these topics we don't talk about in the church, like addiction, depression, mental illness, and, and bipolar. He was eventually diagnosed with bipolar. And... What we saw is a thriving opportunity for ministry to love people in these situations that people don't talk about. Um, the church saw it as pastors don't struggle with these things. And so we were let go from that church, and um, he had to stop taking his medication, and it was only a couple of months that he um, ended up taking his life. Yeah. Um, so sorry. It's hard because... You know, we, we seem to be shocked by the people that, that do take their life, that, sh- that um, by suicide. And Eric was full of life. Like, he, he should still be here, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and so after his death, my life, I mean, everything about my belief system and um, my beliefs about mental illness, even in my practical application with my clients, everything changed because it was like I finally understood yeah. what it was like to live with those type of issues. Yeah. And to Eric, he felt like death was better than life. And that's why I share our story, because that is not truth. Yeah. And I want the church to be the first place that people can run to. Yeah. And know that they can find healing and refuge. And obviously above that, I want them to know that there's a God that welcomes you with open arms when you struggle with these things. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And vulnerability is key in that, I mm-hmm. think. You know, even us as leaders saying, I mean, we don't have to air out all our laundry, but mm-hmm. being able to say, you know, this is what I'm struggling with or what I've struggled with, and this is how God met me. Mm-hmm. even in that weak time, that we don't have to pull up our bootstraps and have it all together and, yeah. you know, yeah. put on this yeah. facade, mm-hmm. but yet inside we feel like we're dying. Yeah. Yes. I think, you know, I see a lot of of steps and um, greater health within churches now than, you know, even a decade ago, but mm-hmm. the reality of it is, is, one, the church is is made up of imperfect people, imperfect leaders, mm-hmm. and um, I know that there's many that are listening, and honestly, all of us in this room have probably been hurt by the church at one point or another, <laughs> or leader figures, mm-hmm. um, but as we continue to talk more about and learn more about mental health and, and, and even 
you know, even addictions and, and how we try to cope, it, it seems that the, the church is, is taking steps in being able to talk about it more, yes. not just with, you know, people that walk through the doors of the church, but for those that are on their staff, you know, mm-hmm. as you mentioned, there was a church that asked y'all to keep quiet about it. And as leaders, you know, and it's not just church leaders, it's really any kind of leader, there is kind of this fear of, you know, I have to be strong for other people. Mm-hmm. My calling is me pouring out to others. And if this is exposed, then what if I hurt others? What if I lose the ability to lead them or to mm-hmm. love them? And, um, you know, Chrissy, I, I, I can tell that that, that experience with uh, the church or the churches was was a source of wounding and mm-hmm. pain. But I also know that today you love the church, mm-hmm. you serve with the church. Um, kind of, can you speak to that journey a little bit? What have you learned in the process um, to still love and have hope for the church, um, but also to navigate through the imperfections of, mm-hmm. of those within the church? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's a this big question. This is so hard. It's so hard because, um, yes, I I am a licensed prof- professional counselor, and I actually work for an organization called Care for Pastors. Mm-hmm. And so what we do is we offer counseling and resources to pastoral families because we are very aware that pastors struggle with these things too, mm-hmm. and there needs to be a safe place for them to go to counseling. And... Um, and not just be the counselor to other people, yeah. right? And and shepherd and, and pastor to other people. Um, and so I, I hear these stories all the time. I've experienced things, and and I hear other people's hurts. Um, but I knew when Eric died, um, and that was my late, late husband's name, when he died, the Sunday after, I wanted to be in church. Hmm. I wanted to be in church because... I knew that was the place that God created on this side of heaven to be the place where we find community Mm. and where we find truth and we find love. And that doesn't mean everyone's going to provide that. And maybe those people are leaders and um, maybe they're just people, you know, that you pass at church or whatnot um, or Christians you've known in the past and you have bad experiences. The church is still the place to be because we're all human. Yeah. We all should have the freedom to be human pastors and people in the church alike. And, um, we don't, we want to have the freedom to live and share about these things and to get help for them. And we need to give that freedom and the church is where that should be happening. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That is the bride of Christ. And that's what I love about Beltway Park is that you're just opening up these hard conversations and saying, we are welcoming people. We may not understand completely and we may not do everything perfect, but we are welcoming people yeah. with these struggles and we want to understand and work together. Yeah. yeah. Something that we say here often is it's okay to not be okay. Mm-hmm. It's just not okay to stay, stay not there. okay, mm-hmm. you know, to yeah. stay in that place. Yeah. And that's uh, when you're when you're opening yourself, <laughs> allowing people humans to be human and to hurt Mm -hmm. you're you're opening up a lot of stuff Mm -hmm. coming in but we can't be scared of it we can't run from it or shy from it because sometimes our greatest sources of pain or struggle are the areas where we learn and discover god you know his character his promises his his faithfulness his Mm -hmm. goodness his ability to redeem and to restore like all of those things Mm -hmm. We learn the character and the nature of God in the midst of our suffering. Mm-hmm. And Chrissy, I know that's something that you and I were talking about earlier, of just developing a theology of suffering and being able to hold mm-hmm. both the joy and the hope while also suffering and grieving mm-hmm. and hurting, and that it's not one or the other, mm-hmm. but it's it's both. Mm-hmm. It's the grief of like... Releasing those shattered dreams of what might not ever happen, mm-hmm. but also knowing that God is going to birth new dreams as a result yeah. of that. Like you losing your voice. Think of that, you know, mm-hmm. the overflow of that mm-hmm. happening and God closed one door and he opened another for you mm-hmm. for such and a does, time as this. It doesn't mean it's, you, I mean, you still don't want suffering. No, it's, yeah. it's, it's no, awful none of us and like it's it. painful. Um, 
And many people can look back and say, oh, I can see what God did there, but there's still so many people that are in the midst of suffering and wondering, God, are you even here? Are you working? And that's why Mm -hmm. voices like ours and the people that y'all have um, on these podcasts are so important because they're here to say, yes, this happened, but also here's what God did Mm -hmm. in this. And and that's really, we were talking earlier, and I just... um, released a book that that I had co-authored with another pastor um, and theologian, and it's called Open Letters to Our Fellow Fighters. And um, it talks about all of this and how the topic of mental illness and and the things that go under the umbrella of mental illness um, need to be talked about in the church and how the church can better help people who struggle with these things. Mm -hmm. But um, as I was kind of closing that book and doing a promo for the book, I felt like I heard the Lord say, okay, Chrissy, you've, you've honored him. Mm-hmm. You've honored him. You've given him a voice when he didn't have a voice. Yeah. Mm. And you're honoring his life. Um, but now, but now go forward, walk forward, mm-hmm. give other people those hopes allow allow other people to share their stories with mm-hmm. you, and I love the passage um, in Second Corinthians one three and four, and it says, "Praise God, the Father of Jesus, and the God of compassion, who comforts us in our troubles, mm-hmm. so that we in turn can comfort those who are suffering." The same comfort that we received from God, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And I don't want to be stuck in my tragedy. I don't want to be stuck. In my trauma, and I, I have trauma, guys. Like, yeah. I am doing all this stuff. I'm an advocate for mental health. I'm a counselor, and mm-hmm. trying to make sure no one ever experiences what we experience. Mm-hmm. But I'm still human. Yeah, and there's still <laughs> trauma, and there's yeah. still yes. triggers yeah. Yeah. to oh, that yes. trauma. I've always yes. wondered. Brett and I were talking yesterday. I've wondered, like, for you, mm-hmm. being both a professional counselor mm-hmm. as well as. You were a wife, and then your husband's gone, mm. and then a mom, and all the juggling all these things in ministry. <laughs> How have you balanced that between giving and receiving? I know what I had to do. I had to go through several years of counseling uh-huh. after my mom died, and then after yes. my husband died, and I received that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I also wasn't a professional like you are. So mm-hmm. how have you been able to it's balance tr- that? <laughs> it's tricky because... The last thing you want to do when you're grieving, um, especially a death of a loved one by, who died by suicide, mm-hmm. who you weren't able to help, and you're a professional counselor, mm-hmm. um, but that's also your job, and you have to um, provide for your children and, and get back out there. So it was very, very tricky and unique, and honestly, <laughs> I don't really know how it'll happen, except the Lord was like, Okay, you got nothing. I'm gonna step in and, mm-hmm. and make this all work out. Um, and somehow it did. The pain um, that I was experiencing, even when I was meeting with people uh, for counseling as their counselor, as their professional counselor, and I think that goes with pastors too. Like we think, okay, we have to have it together, and um, we're leading other people and yeah. we're helping them in their life. But the truth is, the spirit moved both ways. And that's probably a no, no for counselors to say, like we call it transform transference. Um, but God allowed me to have the words and the correct empathy. Mm -hmm. And my tears were actually healing to my clients that I had in that, that season of life. Um, but then there was another side where I was in intensive counseling myself. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm still in counseling. And that takes, yeah. And that takes boldness because again, the the shame that comes with, I'm a counselor and mm-hmm. this happened in my family, like you can either hide from it or you kind of just dive into the middle of it. And that takes mm-hmm. strength to say, you know what, I'm going to go to counseling and push through. I mean, same thing, you know, as a pastor, what you said a minute ago, it's like, oh, I'm supposed to be the one pastoring people. Like, I can't be pastored myself. Like, yeah. that's weak. And it's like, eh, that's... That's no, that's gospel. Like, we need yes. to be led so that we can lead. We need to be pastored yeah. so that we can pastor. We need to be counseled so that we can mm-hmm. counsel. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I, as you go back into that, I just wanted to, to stop and, and say that that takes strength. And anyone listening who you know the next step you need to take, you're just 
you're just afraid. Um, I remember that place in my journey after my divorce. I, I was aware of how much pain that I needed to journey into. And I remember looking at someone, um, a counselor, and saying, I'm afraid to feel all that there is to feel mm. because I'm afraid I'll lose. I'm afraid mm. it'll overtake me. And then I just mm. remember the moment where it was kind of God saying, like, Brett, I am who I say I am. If you go into this place, I will meet you there. Right. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, and, you know, I would, I want to like, I want to make it sound like it was a really easy thing, but <laughs> honestly, I kind of pointed the finger at God and I said, you better be there. And if you're not, I have nothing. Mm-hmm. I believe this about you. Now, God, it's, it's, mm-hmm. I'm literally putting it on you to show up and be faithful because mm-hmm. I've got nothing else. Um, and so for anyone listening that knows that next step that you need to take, but it's just consumed by the fear of it, um, find someone who loves you, who's walking with you, who prays for you, and just ask the Lord, God, show up. I will take this step, and it's the scariest step I'll ever take, and I feel like I might step right off the cliff. Mm-hmm. Um, but I promise you, the Lord meets you in those places and gives you the strength for the moment, gives you the strength for the day. Um, don't worry about what the strength that it's going to take for 10 years down the road. Worry about, okay, strength for today, Mm -hmm. strength for this moment and step Mm -hmm. out and let the Lord meet you in that place. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to Mm -hmm. throw that out there. You Uh, know, so many times if there's something physically wrong, we'll call the doctor and go to the doctor, right? right? But in these kinds of situations, we're heartbroken and our hearts are aching. We've been through trauma and we've got to get help. Mm -hmm. And and so if we would if we would think think of that in in a similar way mm-hmm. of whether it's a professional counselor or something um if we would think about hey I got to get help for this yeah. just like you know mm-hmm. say I found a spot that was skin cancer or something I'd go yeah. to the dermatologist right yeah. um and there's no so shame in there's that there's no, no shame, shame in think that to yeah. say <laughs> there's no shame in that that's what the enemy wants to do he mm-hmm. wants to say what is wrong with you you better hide that don't tell anybody mm-hmm. you know um but there is no shame in getting help whether it's from a professional a friend mm-hmm. getting an evaluation Whatever, mm-hmm. there is no shame in that. It no, did me wonders in healing my heart. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. And we, if you hadn't listened to our previous episodes that we've done on this, but episode six, we had Jennifer Smotherman uh, on, who is a licensed professional counselor and registered play therapist, works with a lot of children. But she, you know, tried to drive home the point we all wrestle with mental health and anxiety. Yes. It is natural, mm-hmm. it is normal. So, anyone listening to this that you think you're the only one or like there's something wrong with you, no, mm-hmm. like it's mm-hmm. all of us. The enemy attacks our minds, the enemy yes. attacks our thoughts, the enemy attacks our identity and our core beliefs. And mm-hmm. so, um, if you're struggling with this, guess what? We all are or have or will at some point. Mm-hmm. So let's step out. And so take take encouragement from Chrissy. She said that not only did she go to counseling, she's still in counseling. And so yes. <laughs> kind of finish kind of finish out Adina's question in that this mm. how does it look balancing? And that I just want to kind of um just ride ride on your coattails just for a second. Yeah. Um about shame. Um because I lived in it for years. Yeah. As a pastor's kid, as a pastor's wife, as a believer, I felt like because we struggled with these things, they were shameful. Mm. And it was something that God looked away from when it was actually quite the opposite. Mm -hmm. Um, Our suffering, our pain, our disabilities, you know, because mental illness is a disease. Um, It's not that something's wrong with you. It's a disease like cancer or... Mm -hmm. Um, My husband had cancer and he had mental illness and they're both diseases. Um, And I think if we see it that way, we can see it as something's not wrong with you, Mm -hmm. but God can use that in you. Mm -hmm. But you have to stop hiding in shame. That's right. God wants to bring light into those dark places. Yes, yes. The Satan loves the dark. Yeah. And that's what we're doing when we're not talking about it, when we're not acknowledging it or getting help for it, we're staying in the dark and there's no goodness there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So bring it out and that's hard and that's vulnerable and it's not easy, but God can use it. 
God can't. And I can, I'm a living testimony. He will use it. So yes, ask for help. Tell somebody. Um, go to counseling. Um, also to grief share. Um, I A week after my husband died, I, I, I remember my mom had to pretty much carry me to the car, take me to grief share, and I sat there and cried the whole time. And I was humiliated just because I couldn't talk about what had happened. And I was heartbroken. And But just being there, just hearing other people's stories gave me the confidence to say my story. And as soon as I talked about it, I saw lives changed yeah. Yeah. through a small nobody from East Texas girl who was a pastor's wife and whose husband wasn't at a big mega church or anything, but that story mattered and saved lives. And I've seen that the last two years. And that yeah. has been even through the suffering and the trauma and the trauma uh, that my kids will have to experience because this is a part of their story. Um, the goodness of God will always trump that. Yeah. Because he has provided. Yeah. I mean, that something that I love about the faithfulness of God is that he is a God that creates life. Like it is what he does and he never stops doing it. And so even in the places where we experience death, whether that's death of a dream, whether that's death of a loved one, death of, you know, an ability to to use our our bodies or limbs or functions, death of anything, it is in the nature of God to always bring something to life. And in fact, the very gospel, our greatest hope is because of death, like the death of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Like it was, mm -hmm. it was put on the cross, but life still prevailed. Life still came forth. It's, it's just what he does. And so mm -hmm. when we can, when we can face it and talk about it, like even what you just said, just talking about it, um, the healing that God is so faithful to bring. And and I'm sure for you, as you've talked about, not only did you see it, um, you know, help with healing for people, but it was probably healing and is still healing for you and for your family, like you oh, said. Yes, yes. When someone writes and says, I heard your story, or I heard this podcast, or, and I was going to take my life, but I chose not to. I mean... Wow. Praise the Lord. It's just like, God is like, life, life, life. Yes. And um, he didn't want Eric to die. I think he wanted him here. I mean, I know he wanted him here. He had a plan for his life, and that plan was cut short. But God is not just going to leave us in dry land. He's going to say, okay, this is horrible. Um, I had so much more for Eric, and he took his life, and I welcomed him with open arms mm -hmm. because he was my child. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But watch me now. Mm -hmm. Watch me Make beauty from the ashes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Watch and see what grows because he does not leave us there. He yeah. doesn't. Mm -hmm. He just doesn't. And that's the hope. Yeah. That's the hope that we have is whatever you're dealing with, whatever you're struggling with, and, and to those who are thinking about taking their life or have a loved one who's struggled with that, um, I hope that this speaks life to them, yeah. um, lets them know that um, they're never too far gone that they are loved, that they were created for a purpose, that they breathe air for a reason, and to keep fighting because years from now, you might be sitting in this chair, you know, sharing yeah. like, I wanted to die, but I chose to fight. And yeah. now I see the benefits of that. Yeah. A lot of times I think another thing that we, my family had to process after my mom's suicide was, okay, how do you reconcile the whole idea of, okay, a Christian committed suicide, you mm -hmm. know, took their life. And Romans 8 has been such a powerful whole chapter, but specifically the verses that talk about um, nothing can separate us from mm -hmm. the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. And that was a seed that grew in my heart and brought a lot of healing to know the hope of heaven and eternity with my mom again. Mm -hmm. So then later, when my husband also took his life, that wasn't an area I struggled with that specific yeah. area because God had already revealed that truth. Mm -hmm. um, but I share all that because so many times people who have had loved ones die by suicide, they're thinking, well, that was like the worst sin ever. Mm -hmm. You know, or, am, am I going to see them again? Mm -hmm. And 
that's what we need. Whether it's suicide or a death by cancer or something else, we've got to have that hope of if they knew Jesus, that we mm-hmm. get to see them and spend eternity together. Mm-hmm. At the same time, we're carrying on our calling here on earth, right? Yes, yes. And the shattered dreams that God is turning into something beautiful Mm -hmm. and new dreams. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I want to be real. I think I hid, like I said, I hid in shame for so long, pretending that these things didn't affect me. And the freedom in talking about it, even as as a Christian, as a pastor's wife, um, changed my life for the better. Um. If you don't know Jesus, if you struggle with these things and you don't know Jesus, I think that's going to be, I mean, it's always going to be the message, but we couldn't, you couldn't have probably understood all these things like you do, and you probably couldn't heal like you did, and because Jesus in our lives is what has made me continue living. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. And the purpose and knowing that God has a purpose and a plan um, keeps me living and keeps me hoping for my children that they're going to have thriving lives. Yeah. Um, it's the gospel and what, um, who Jesus is mm-hmm. that we keep living. And so I know that's the simplicity of, of, of obviously why church exists. And, yeah. But I just, if you don't know him, mm-hmm. all your problems won't be solved if you do but you won't be alone. And we're created yeah. to not be alone. And this pain that you're experiencing, experiencing will have purpose. And so mm-hmm. I, I definitely want to say that because we do have that hope because of Jesus mm-hmm. that we'll see him again. We have that hope that we're going to be okay and understand how this fits in our life here because of Jesus. Mm-hmm. And um, But also I think it's an important message for the church to share that God provides us hope through Jesus and the gospel and scripture but he also provides us hope through resources Mm -hmm. that your community offers. And that is Christian counselors, doctors, medications. There's so much now, Um, even neurofeedback, which I won't go into, but (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) go research it. It's really cool. Um, But God provides us with those things. And Mm -hmm. I think that's a message that the church needs to share. Like, yes, the Bible has all the answers and gives us hope, and and the church provides those answers, but the church is going to partner with um, community resources to make sure that you have all the help that you can. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I just think that's part of it, too. Yeah. Um, As we begin to wrap up, um, you know, you mentioned that, that Jesus is what has given you the hope to go forward, and you even feel like He has instructed you, you know, you've honored your husband well, Mm -hmm. let's not, yes, the past is part of your story, but let's move forward. What does that look like for you today, Chrissy? What is, what's your hope? What's your dream? What's your day to day? Mm -hmm. And yeah, what does that look like going forward? (laughs) My first answer is, I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) I I don't know. We'll see. I'm asking that question and I'm like, I hope nobody asks me. Well, you know, know. the most (laughs) common thing, I even heard it this morning, was a story about a son telling his mother, who's lost her husband, his dad, get mm-hmm. over it. Oh, goodness. Mom, you just need to get over it. So that's a common thing that's, that yes. people express in those words. Mm-hmm. But you can't just get over the love of your life, mm-hmm. right? So how do you, how do you yeah. move forward? Well, and I think... In my case or in other people's cases, like, get over it, or you try to minimize it, or you don't even know what to say. And um, the truth is, our pain and our suffering and our grief and trauma, um, like I said, it just, it all matters. Mm -hmm. And I think it's it's so unfair to say get over it. Mm -mm. And I even don't even like time heals all wounds, because I don't know if I'll ever be healed this side of heaven. I think I will see the blessings of the Lord, and I think I'll see healing but those things sometimes never go away. And so I, I try to help people understand, like, these are things you do say, these are things you don't say. Um, and, and get over it is one of those things, yeah. or you're not over it yet, or uh, go pray, you know, and, and God should heal you immediately. Um, those things are just not real life. Um, and God can heal you immediately, but then you blame God when he doesn't. And so 
Um, I think that could be a whole other segment on what yeah. to say and not say. But, um, and I, I say this all the time, sit on the bench with people. Don't presume you understand mm. because you've been through it or been through something similar. Just sit and listen and be. Yeah. Um, be with people yeah. and have the heart to listen. Yeah. And someone, I'm going to pause you, someone listening to this right now who has a friend or a family member or someone you know that is going through something and you feel so ill-equipped to <laughs> help them, do exactly what Chrissy just said. Like, sit with them, be with them. The power in the ministry of presence mm-hmm. is far more healing than we know. Yeah. You don't have to try to come up with a formula or <laughs> In fact, or the a lot right of times words. it's better don't say anything. Yeah, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Just say, hey, That's why I love the I'm here. I don't know. Yeah. I'm here, but I'm here. But and I'm I here. will commit to loving and I'm, you. And I'm willing to sit here in the uncomfortable. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Might be silence too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And help me understand. That's a good question. Help me understand. Mm. And if they don't have an answer, then just sit and be okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's power in silence, man. Yeah. And so what what am I doing now? Yeah. Um, first and foremost, my ministry is to my children. Yeah. Um, ooh, I love my kids so much. And that this is a part of their story breaks my heart. Um, but gosh, I can see the Lord's hand on their life. And um, I just want to be the best, very human. I always call myself a hot mess. The best, very human, hot mess mom I can be (laughs) (laughs) that will love them and that will teach them that this world hurts and they will go through hurt and they will go through pain, but that they will see God in that pain and that they will see the reason for living in that pain and that they will fight with all their might. And so that, that of course, is my first love and my first... um, ministry, but um, God has given me opportunities to to speak and to, to share our story and to talk about hope, but to also help equip um, the church and, and to talk about these things within the evangelical community um, because they weren't talked about in my world. And I want the church, again, to be the safe place that people when they're like, I'm hurting, what's the first thing I want to do? Go to church. Mm. I want to know God. I want to know community. I want to know unconditional love that says, okay, you're an opioid addict. How can we help you? Mm-hmm. And walk in those doors, and this is the place they know they can find help. And yeah. so I use our story and our experiences and um, all the things we've been through to, to just go around and, and continue the conversation about mental illness to help educate and bring awareness to these topics and something we can talk about, but also provide hope for. Yeah. Um, so that's what I'm doing. That's awesome. So what, as we finish, what are some resources that you might recommend to people listening? What have been helpful for you, but what, as a professional, do you also um, <laughs> let other people know are resources? And obviously, I so that you don't have to. I know you probably won't. I will make a plug for your book. Oh, thank you. Um, go on. It was just released. Monday. Um, yeah, we're recording this wow. on, uh, a, I don't even know what day Thursday. it is. It's Thursday. <laughs> it's Thursday right now. It'll be Tuesday by the time you hear this. Um, but yeah, Chrissy's book, Open Letters to Our Fellow Fighters, was just released. And so you can go uh, to Amazon and get that. Chrissy Lane Garland and Rob Phillips. Pastor Rob Phillips, open letters to our fellow fighters. But what yes. other resources have been helpful for you, or would you recommend to someone who's just struggling with mental health? You know, stinking thinking, like the mm-hmm. the things that are on repeat in our mind that that we we don't often let other people know about. What mm-hmm. what are some resources that you might recommend? Well, and kind of on the the mind thing is. Um, Part of the work I do is, is neurofeedback, and I kind of want to do a plug for that because um, I love it when people come in, and it's it's really just seeing what's going on in your brain, and just it gives people hope to know that they're not crazy. <laughs> like they actually, <laughs> there is actual evidence that something is going on in their brain, and so hopefully that kind of gives hope too, and and that this is a 
mental issue, a physiological issue, a, um, it, it could be a spiritual, it's a holistic issue. Um, and so I just want to put in a plug for hope there because it actually scientifically shows, you know, yeah. that, Hey, you're struggling with this and it shows, um, but resources, um, so I'd like to plug in some resources yeah. somehow to this podcast, but I have a list of resources on my blog. And again, it's a very just me blog. It's, it's yeah. rinky dink, just me writing. But I also have a resources page where people can find access to counselors in their area, mm -hmm. um, to books that may help with trauma, grief, mental illness. Um, that's also in the resources section of my blog, chrissyjoy.com. And that's um, Chrissy, K-R-I-S-S-I-E, <laughs> joy.com. Yes, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> um, my name is spelled so unique. Um, but that's the best place that I can just tell you really quickly to find resources. And hopefully, hopefully from there, maybe you can find others. But it's a simple list. Also, the church. I'm in Beltway yeah. Park. Um, Y'all seem... You obviously have heart for people who are struggling with this and hurting and trying to really understand these issues. So even this church as a resource, I think, is amazing. Um, but I just want to say, um, and also care for pastors. That's the organization I work for. If you're a pastoral family, um, kid, spouse, pastor, you can reach out to us at careforpastors.org and find counseling and resources there. But I loved this quote um, from C.S. Lewis, and it says, mental pain, and this is why just if anything, if you're struggling, if you're hurting, reach out, go check into these research resources. And um, many people know C.S. Lewis. He's uh, just a phenomenal author, um, brilliant man. But um, he said, mental pain is less dramatic than physical pain, but it is more common and also more hard to bear. The frequent attempt to conceal mental pain increases the burden. It is easier to say my tooth is aching than to say my heart is broken. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that just should help people know it is hard to reach out, but if you are struggling, if you have a loved one struggling, how important it is to reach out. And yeah. everything we've talked about today should show the importance of living, yeah. choosing life, getting help for these things. And um, and also, just as a believer, as a ministry leader, I say, you know, my brokenness has been a better bridge to people than my pretend wholeness ever was. Amen. And that's the same for you. So Amen. reach out and get help and um, trust that the Lord is going to use it. Absolutely. Wow. That was so good. Chrissy, Beautiful. thank you so much. And Adina, thank you again thank you. for jumping on. Um, we'll include those resources and the link to Chrissy's blog um, and to her book in the show notes. But Chrissy, thank you so much for being here. Uh, we welcome you back as part of our Beltway family. Uh -oh, awesome. um, and we hope to have more times with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Beyond Sundays podcast in this episode with Chrissy Lane Garland. The resources that Chrissy has available through her blog, we will put that link into the show notes. It's chrissyjoy.com. And we encourage everyone, go grab a copy of her book that just came out, Open Letters to Our Fellow Fighters. Be sure to hit that subscribe, like, or follow button to this podcast, depending on the platforms that you are using, so that you can stay up to date with the episodes we release each Tuesday. And we we encourage you, go ahead and subscribe to us on our YouTube channel at Beltway Park Church so that you can follow along with the sermon series and all of the content that we put out each week. We hope you have a great week. Be blessed. And remember, God is moving in your life beyond Sundays.